Okay, good morning, folks. Uh, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the Street Database. Erica, hey, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? <laughs> Long time no see. Miss you. I know. Um, Are you feeling better? Yeah, I'm doing much better today. Yeah, it uh, finally picked up yesterday. Okay, good. Continue. <laughs> well, good to see you. Um, and I think we've got a couple of people joining in. Uh, basically, jump in, heckle, ask questions at any point in time. This is going to be super informal, unlike the usual talk. Um, so, yeah. See how many uh, pop culture references we can avoid making today. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name's Kyle. We're going to be talking about distributed systems, uh, distributed databases in particular. Um, and I'm going to give a version of a talk, uh, which I would have given at CraftConf had I not uh, gotten sick. Um, so there's a, we're going to talk about this for about hmm, maybe 45, 50 minutes, and then there'll be Q&A after, uh, or whenever you like. So we'll dive right in. Uh, I've got some delicious slides here for everybody to enjoy. And let's see. All right, looks good. So this talk is Jepson 5, uh, What Even Are Computers? Uh, my name is Kyle Kingsbury, but you might know me better as Afer. Uh, if I were a um, playful children's cartoon character from a German uh, TV series, I might be a computer seizure heights full share and dress like this. Uh, I am working, uh, like many people, on uh, products that have sort of imaginary components. Uh, for example, let's say you're a company that provides an API for users to call over maybe HTTP. That's not a real product. You can't go out and pick it up at the store. Uh, it's an illusion, which is supported by uh, real computers, real code living somewhere in a data center. Um, that code here is represented as steel girders supporting the illusory rainbow the API. Uh, that code might be written on top of a VM uh, or a runtime like Ruby. And then those, those uh, you know, wooden, um, rickety language structures are sunk firmly into a foundation of distributed databases and queues, things we found lying around on the internet, uh, represented here by a pile of tires. Now, as anybody who has ever worked on a database knows, the pile of tires is usually on fire. Uh, but our job as operations engineers is to isolate uh, the public-facing API from the underlying tire fire so that people can continue to do the operations they care about while we're busy trying to put out the fire. So we're taking unreliable components and making reliable parts. This is the whole theme of distributed systems. We don't have perfect computers, but if we put two of them together, maybe they can be more reliable than just one. Not just databases here. I'm thinking about uh, queues, discovery services, coordination services. Um, these things are uh, the title cards to horror movies for sysadmins. Uh, they inspire fear and loathing into our hearts uh, because they do terrible things. You know, you can you can ask a database about uh, something and get two completely different answers depending on what node you're talking to. If it allows a situation called split brain, you can have broken foreign key relationships. Uh, maybe you use an active record constraint, uh, but that's no guarantee that the underlying database can't get into a state where some referent is missing for a reference. So you can go to look up a user's uh, maybe um, blog post, or you might have a blog post and go to look up a user, and the other key is not there anymore. These consistency constraints have to be enforced at the database level, typically. You can't do them at the application level. You can also see transient anomalies in systems which don't preserve properties with linearizability. So you might try to write a value, and it succeeds. You go to read it, and it's gone. And you try another read, and it shows up again. Uh, so these sort of brief blips in visibility can cause interesting uh, transient anomalies that are really hard to track down in your production infrastructure. In the face of these, we want to know if the system is safe. Um, but it's hard to tell, you know, how often do these theoretical problems actually manifest? So I've been trying to actually go out and measure different systems and see whether or not in production, in real, you know, deployed software, we can reproduce these theoretical problems. This is the goal of Jepson. Uh, it's a software library for writing distributed systems tests and a series of tests and analyses and blog posts that I've written up uh, on certain distributed systems as case studies. Jepson, as a systems testing tool, uh, you know, models the system as having a nice boundary. We don't have to care about what the network or the nodes or the functions or any of the individual little bits inside the distributed system do. We just say that overall, it has to interact with the environment, the clients, 
in a way that has some predictable rules. At the boundary between the system and the environment, there should be some, some invariance, like if I put something into a queue, it should come out again. If I write a value to a database and the database says, yes, it's stored, I should be able to go get it at some later time. It shouldn't disappear. Now, the clients uh, are going to be sort of outside the system, but we're actually going to run them all in the same uh, virtual machine, the same JVM. And the reason for that is that we need to know very precisely when each client attempts an operation and when it completes in order to reconstruct timing information to, to see if a system uh, preserves certain, certain real-time properties. Uh, the database itself is going to be running on five nodes, which I run typically in an LXC cluster, uh, but could also be on Amazon or physical hardware. The only thing Jepson cares about is that it can SSH the nodes and run different commands. Now, we have no visibility in the database itself. Uh, this is an explicit choice because oftentimes I want to test a closed source database where I may not be able to understand the internal structure. All that I have access to as a tester is what the clients see, uh, maybe the writes they perform and the acknowledgments and the reads they perform and the acknowledgments. So our clients are going to generate randomized operations like write a value 5. We'll apply them to the distributed system, and then it'll come back with some response. Uh, if you're lucky, it comes back OK, and we know the operation took place. If we're unlucky, it fails. And then we have to say, well, that operation did not take place. Sometimes you know it failed because the database says, oh, that would violate a consistency constraint. Or, I'm sorry, uh, I am in an offline maintenance mode right now and can't take any writes. You know the operation wouldn't have happened. But what if you don't know what happens? Uh, maybe the database crashes, maybe the client crashes, the network loses your message and something times out. If this happens, you have no way to tell if the operation happened or not. And it could happen at any later time. So we have to allow for requests to be delivered maybe 10 minutes or a year from now. It's really tricky to prevent those sorts of things from coming back later. So we'll log an informational message and leave that invocation open for all time, just in case it happens later. So over time, we're going to build up a concurrent history. We'll get an invocation and a completion. The process might try to invoke something, and then it could fail. If you ever invoke something and crash, we're going to keep that logical single threaded process running until the end of the test, uh, just to allow it to potentially complete at some later point. And then over this concurrent history of operations, we're going to try and figure out if it made sense to follow the rules of the system. So for a linearizable system, we have to find a path that goes off forwards in time and touches every OK operation, maybe uses the crashed operations too. Uh, if we're looking at a commutative system, we don't need this strict real-time order. We could jump around, start here, move back, move forward, move back, uh, because commutative systems don't have uh, sort of ordering constraints. So a serializable database is allowed to reorder its transactions, but a linearizable one has to proceed in real time. And our checkers are going to have to reflect this problem. So the general scheme is to generate randomized operations for whatever your, your system does. Maybe it's a queue, maybe it's a lock service. We're going to record a history of those operations and what happened to them. And we'll verify that history matches some model of the system, some abstract definition. And while this is going on, we're going to get out our really big printing shears and start cutting up the network and see what happens. So what have I found? Uh, I started doing this back in May of 2013. I started with React. Um, and React has a, a sort of well-documented, but maybe not well-understood, um, pair of modes. There's last right wins mode, the default, where they use wall clock timestamps to resolve conflicts. And that, of course, leads to the opportunity to lose a write. You can, you can perform a write that will just be destroyed by some other uh, update that happened previously. Uh, there's also a CRDT mode with, uh, with allow molt and siblings. And if you use that, you can do commutative operations safely. MongoDB uh, lost data at all levels of write concern back in May of 2013. Uh, this is due to the fact that the majority write concern, when it had a network failure, it would check off the OK box on the response and send it back to the client uh, instead of telling it that the request failed. That bug was quickly patched. Redis Sentinel would enter split brain for the duration of the partition and lose all data on one of the replicas when it returned. Cassandra in 2013 at version 2.0.0. Uh, of course, it uses last write wins to resolve conflicts, so it's possible for uh, a write from the past to overwrite something from the future. So you could write A and then write B, and the write of B would be destroyed by A. Uh, it also has a row-level isolation mechanism, which is uh, statistical at best. 
uh, and it had a transactional system built on Paxos, which had a deadlock bug, and when the deadlock bug was fixed, it had a data loss bug where it would double apply transactions causing data loss. Uh, that's also since fixed. NuoDB uh, long ago claimed to be the cap theorem, and the way it achieves this is by buffering all requests in RAM during a partition. Uh, once you run out of RAM, the system sort of goes down. Um, this is, of course, not beating cap. It's just not available during the partition. Kafka, in its 08 beta, back in 2013 as well, uh, had an in-sync replica set. This is the set of nodes it considers to be up-to-date with the most recent writes. That set could shrink to no nodes at all, at which point uh, all of your committed messages would have been lost. Um, the new version of Kafka, the one that actually shipped after the beta, uh, includes tunable thresholds where you can say, don't let the in-sync replica set shrink below a certain number of nodes, and that gives you F safety. Zookeeper actually passed. Um, this doesn't mean Zookeeper is correct. Uh, there's a wonderful write-up, I believe, from PageDuty about a Zookeeper bug that I think was triggered by some sort of Linux kernel issue with checksums on TCP virtual devices. Um, so it's not, you know, this is not a demonstration of correctness per se. Uh, all that I can tell you is that it failed to exhibit bad behavior under certain conditions. NCD and console uh, mostly worked, but they allowed stale reads. Uh, they're consistent read. Uh, option would allow you to read a value from the past, uh, and that's since been fixed in both systems. Back in 2014, I tested Elasticsearch. Uh, it loses documents in every class of partition that I tested, um, usually catastrophically. You could also deadlock the cluster requiring full restarts and all sorts of other issues. RabbitMQ uh, will enter split brain and destroy all messages on one replica, much like uh, Redis does. The time window, however, is more limited. You can tune it to be uh, re reasonably short. AeroSpikeDB in 2015 uh, claimed to be an ACID database, but turned out to actually be last right wins, like uh, React and Cassandra, and so it didn't have any ACID properties. It would lose updates. Elasticsearch 1.5, I went back and retested in uh, uh, May of 2015, and it still lost it in every test case, but it loses less. Uh, the windows for data loss have been significantly shortened, and I believe they've recently closed one of the last uh, partition data loss bugs in GitHub, so they might have had a, a breakthrough there. MongoDB 267, I uh, went back and re-verified in May of 2015 again. Uh, the majority write concern uh, now appears to allow you to do linearizable updates and writes, but reads can exhibit two sort of not-so-great properties. One of them is stale reads, where you can read values in the past. Uh, the other one is dirty reads, where you can read values that never should have existed at all. Um, stale reads are a little less bad. They were undocumented. Dirty reads are terrible and are documented. Uh, MongoDB 3.2 introduces a new read concern or read preference, I can't remember which, um, which allows you to eliminate dirty reads, but still allow stale read anomalies, so it's not fully linearized. The TLDR of this litany of fear uh, is that it, as an industry, we haven't been paying sufficient attention to verifying our systems in the face of uh, distributed systems failure modes. So process crashes, uh, network faults, uh, desynchronized clocks, these sorts of things tend to cause really strange anomalies in the systems that we use every day. And I'm trying to, uh, by publishing these test results, push vendors and users to think a little more rigorously about how their software will behave in these conditions and hopefully we can get a little bit better about handling them. We don't have to be perfect. We just have to do you know, some reasonable trade-off. Well, we've talked a lot about databases, and uh, now for something completely different, I want to discuss uh, a scheduling system uh, called Kronos. Kronos is a part of the Mesos uh, sort of ecosystem. Uh, it's like Cron, but instead of running on a single mode to schedule tasks, it schedules tasks across a distributed cluster. So Kronos, Zookeeper, and Mesos uh, operate together to provide the scheduling system. Um, at the time of writing Mesos, use the term master and slave. This is problematic terminology, and it is being changed now, uh, which is great. Um, the Mesos, what am I going to call them, primary nodes or leaders or deciders, uh, they have run their own replicated uh, multi-Paxos. So they've got a leader and some replicated state machine right here. The Kronos nodes, uh, have actually their own separate FSM and their own leader system to decide what tasks to schedule. And then the Mesos nodes will actually decide which uh, machines to allocate those tasks to. And both of them communicate with Zookeeper for service discovery and coordination. 
Zookeeper, of course, uses Zab, which is its own replicated state machine. So we've got three separate clusters, three separate state machines uh, that all have to work together to provide the system uh, that we want. So when you run a task in Mesos, uh, it doesn't really operate like a database. You don't get a response that says your task has been run. Um, the API lets you add and remove tasks, but it doesn't let you tell what happened to them. So the way that I wrote this test is I would enqueue a task via the API, and that task's job is to write out a file to the file system. And if I run all the boxes on the same underlying clock uh, virtualized, then I have a very strong guarantee about what those timestamps in the files are going to be. So I can go and look at the file systems of all the nodes and identify, OK, what time was the file actually written? And was it written during the window that it was supposed to be? So if we have a target and we say, OK, you're supposed to write this file between 12 o'clock and 12.02, and there's a file that shows up at 12.01, it's valid. If the file shows up later, not at all, it's invalid. So over time, we're going to add new jobs. And each job is going to repeat on some schedule for some number of indications. And we hope to see uh, that every one of them is satisfied by some indication. Uh, now, there's a couple of issues that I found with Kronos and Mesos. Uh, one of them is that they'll crash for lots of trivial conditions, like losing a network connection. Um, this is apparently by design, except that sometimes it doesn't crash. So if you're testing uh, Kronos and Mesos, and you test some failure modes, and you find out that it recovers cleanly, you might deploy it to production without realizing that another way it could fail is to just explode, and you have to run a daemon to restart it. So make sure you add watchdog processes to keep these things running. In the tests, I actually have an explicit schedule that goes through and kicks all the nodes every so often to wake them up. So uh, if you run these tasks uh, on a fully connected cluster with no partitions, everything works just fine. Every invocation is satisfied. But if we cut off, say, two nodes from three nodes, this is a scenario that you would expect to continue working, at least some of the time, because there's a majority available. And typically, uh, you know, Paxos machines tend to work when there's a majority left. The problem is that it doesn't run anymore. Uh, in fact, uh, depending on your, your topology, uh, once the Zookeeper connection is lost, you might see that no tasks ever run again. Uh, not just for the duration of the partition, but as long as you wait, the cluster will never execute another task. So that's kind of troubling. That's not what you want, uh, I think, from a, a task scheduling system. I'm looking at the logs for this, and it's a little confusing. Like the partition occurs, and then Crows detects that the Zookeeper connection has gone away. Zookeeper, meanwhile, is uh, reorganizing itself and electing a new leader on the remaining primaries. Uh, Kronos pauses. It doesn't crash. Uh, it waits for the network connection to come back. And indeed, the partition ends and the network connection is reestablished. Kronos goes through an election cycle and gets a leader. And then nothing. No tasks run, even though everybody seems to be healthy and talking. So I'm asking, like, why can't this new Kronos leader run any tasks? It turns out that uh, Kronos, when it re-registers with Mesos, it provides a thing called a framework ID. And that says, hi, I'm the, the person, the agent, whose job it is to manage some resources. And my, uh, my name is this. Well, the old Kronos provided one framework ID and grabbed all the resources in the cluster. The new instance of Kronos, you know, it's the same nodes. It's just that it's re-elected a new leader. The new one decides on a new ID, but it can't get any resources because they're all owned by the old instance of Kronos. Um, and the only way to get around that is to force the old Kronos to release its resources. So you can add an option to Mesa that's called an offer timeout, which forces it to uh, reacquire those resources if they're not used by a framework. And that lets us sort of kill off the old framework and keep working after a few seconds. If you add an offer timeout, you might see uh, complete unavailability during a partition, depending on the topology of the, of the partition and whether or not it leaves three leaders, one for each component connected. So you have to have a leader for Zookeeper, a leader for Mesos, and a leader for Kronos, all of which can talk. And if that's satisfied, you can keep working there during the partition. But if it's not, you'll stop work. The good news is that with the offer timeout, after a few seconds, it'll start running jobs again, mostly. Some jobs don't recover. I'm not really sure why. With an offer timeout, if you have a connected cluster, you might see transient failures and maybe a wave of failures later during a re-election cycle. It's also not clear why things continue to sporadically not run. 
Well, it turns out uh, that Neil Conway went and dug into this for quite some time and came out with this uh, really cool bug. There's a race condition in the Mesos node recovery process. When Mesos goes to restart its Paxos implementation, uh, it has to catch up to its current state. And when it's catching up, it can't process any promise or write operations, so it ignores them. This is very sensible, but the coordinator for those promise and write ops is waiting for a response for a completion to those operations. And because they're silently ignored, it has no idea what to do. It can't terminate. So that means a Paxos round, which is used for electing a leader, for deciding to run an operation, those rounds could stall indefinitely. And that's why you still get these sort of weird sporadic failures and uh, election problems. So fixing this, uh, you know, it's now fixed in Mesos, and I think the Kronos ticket is still open, but will likely be closed soon. Uh, this should hopefully address uh, some, if not all, of those issues. So if you're a Kronos user, uh, you know, I recommend that you co-locate your, your Kronos. So uh, put uh, Zookeeper, Mesos, Control, and Kronos node all in the same uh, physical instance. And the idea here is that if you have a partition, it's likely to cut all three clusters into the same shape, which will leave you with leaders that can talk to each other. If you have them separated out into different clusters, the chances of any random partition taking out the system are higher. You should also write wrappers to the Chronos and Mesos daemons to restart them. Uh, use Schedule Horizon and Offer Timeout to control uh, whether or not your tasks will run again. And then monitor your jobs and daemon restarts to look out for continuous failure scenarios. We've talked a lot about NoSQL systems in the past, uh, but I'm actually interested in all sorts of distributed systems, and that includes SQL databases. So I want to talk about a system called Galera Cluster. This is a, a replication library for MySQL, MariaDB, Percona, ExtraDB. Uh, all these use or can use Galera to replicate their state. So Galera slots into a MySQL node or a MariaDB node and uh, copies that state and the transaction that you're performing over to other MySQL nodes. So you can talk to any one of the nodes and see the data across all three. Uh, and then it will provide some sort of concurrency control to keep things sane. This is really nice from an operation perspective. It's easy to install, easy to set up. Uh, you don't have to change your API at all. It's just MySQL, but replicated. Um, now, between nodes, Galera claimed to provide snapshot isolation. And that's a property where you have a sort of main line of transactions. And anytime you want to do a transaction, you sort of fork the history into your own private world. So you can do a transaction like write the value one to the top cell and then commit back. Meanwhile, someone else could fork the world, not see these changes because they're all independent, and on their own snapshot, they could write two to the bottom cell and commit. Because one and two don't conflict, they, they affect different cells, this is a legal schedule. So it's fine for you to commit to separate uh, cells. However, if you try to commit to the same cell, the one that got there first wins. This first committer wins principle means that anybody else that tries to update a cell and would not have seen the conflicting update in their transaction, they have to roll back or abort. Now, the documentation said that the snapshot isolation level occurs with people read and, snap, or, and uh, serializability. So if we use serializability, we assume we'll get snapshot isolation. Um, this is the kind of mental model you might get, you know, read and committed. Uh, is superseded by recommitted, which is implied by recovery, which is implied by snapshot isolation. It's not quite right. The actual diagram uh, is that uh, recommitted supersedes read uncommitted. Repeatable read eats that, and serializability eats that. Repeatable read and snapshot isolation are not directly comparable. Repeatable read allows a certain class of phantom anomalies called A3. Snapshot isolation allows anomalies A5B, which is right skew, and P6, which is a read only anomaly. Uh, the TLDR of this gobbledygook is that um, they're not directly comparable. One of them doesn't imply the other. But if we set our transaction isolation level to serializable, we're going to get snapshot isolation according to the docs. So we're not going to verify the stronger property. We're going to verify snapshot isolation, but we're going to execute our transactions at the serializable level. I want to be real clear about this because a lot of the response to the post uh, focuses on repeatable read, which is not something we talk about at all in the JEPS analysis. So, how do we actually write a test? Uh, we can't use a linearizability checker um, because linearizability requires real-time operations. And in snapshot isolation, it's legal to read a value from the past 
The only constraint is that you can't commit data back, which would have changed uh, during your transaction. So we have to allow stable reads, and we have to allow um, concurrent read anomalies. So we're going to design a special system, uh, not a general checker, but a very particular case that might reveal uh, whether or not the system supports snapshot isolation. So you can imagine two bank accounts, uh, each with you know ten dollars in it. You want to transfer some money back and forth. The idea is that we never lose or create money. That sum over the accounts is always a constant. This is of course not how banks are actually run, right? You have a transaction ledger instead, and it's reconciled. But just as a sort of mental model for an abstract system, you can think about it. Now. So we've got ten dollars each account, and the top transaction is going to move two dollars down, so it forks a snapshot. It writes 8 and 12 on top of 10 and 10, and then commits. The bottom transaction wants to move $5 up, so it writes 5 and 15, and then commits. But it can't commit because somebody else has changed the cells that it wants to talk to. So first committer wins ensures that this transaction must report. That implies that any pair of transfer operations that touch uh, the same account must serialize. And this doesn't just apply to two accounts, but for three, four, or five. Whatever you do, if the if the accounts overlap in any way, they can only be performed sequentially. And that enforces that the overall amount of money isn't going to change. The other property is that reads have to come from a snapshot. And so it, we can never see intermediate states like 8 and 10. We can only see 10 and 10 or 8 and 12. So consistent reads plus that serializability constraint over trans uh, transfers means that the sum of accounts that we see from a query is always going to be a constant. So we're going to generate a whole bunch of random transfers and a whole bunch of reads, and hopefully we're going to see the sum of $20 every time. Or maybe not. Uh, it turns out that you can sometimes get these weird results. Like here, 8 and 12 sums to 20, 5 and 15 sums to 20, and then 7 and 15, that's 22. Something went wrong. And then we go back to 7 and 13, that sums to 20 again. There's this little blip. It's almost like this 15 came from the previous transaction, and the 7 came from the next transaction. That's, that's odd. You could imagine that maybe if I, if I did a transactional read and it wasn't really transactional, it wasn't really isolated, uh, I could read 10 from the bottom cell and somebody else could commit 8 and 12. And I could read 8 from the top cell and get this mixed state of 8 and 10. Uh, this is, of course, uh, illegal. It's, it's a read skew. A5A is the name for this phenomenon. And it's not allowed in snapshot isolation. You, you can't do this um, because your reads are supposed to happen in a snapshot. But it actually gets worse. Not only can we read in valid state, but we can commit it back in the database. So let's start off with this mixed state that we just talked about, 8 and 10. Well, if you use that state as a part of a transfer transaction to transfer, say, $5 up, you subtract 5 from 10 and get 5. You add 5 to 8 and get 13, and then we commit 13 and 5 back, and because, well, hang on a second, we're not supposed to be able to commit here. Why shouldn't we commit? Because between the time we started the transaction and when we committed, somebody else, this blue transaction, came in and wrote over the values that we wanted to write. So first committer wins should ensure that this transaction reports and doesn't commit that illegal state. But it turns out that we actually, uh, we actually do see this phenomenon. This is illegal, but it happens. Um, so over time, you can slowly add or gain money. And the Galera engineers actually write, you know, first committer wins rule is not honored by Galera certification. Well, cool story, bros. Uh, you know, if you if you don't have uh, first committer wins, you can't claim snapshot isolation. Um, you know, this, this is done, I guess, for performance reasons, but it's uh, it's certainly not um, the same transactional model. Uh, now, the other reason this happens, uh, looking a little deeper now, is that InnoDB implements the serializable isolation level by changing your transactions a little bit. Every time you do a read in a, in a transaction, like a select star from whatever, um, InnoDB adds an extra clause. It says select uh, with, uh, what is it, with lock shared or with uh, shared read lock or whatever. The, the point is that it acquires a shared read lock for every read-only transaction operation. And you have to acquire an exclusive write lock every time you write a cell. And the combination of shared read locks and exclusive write locks held for the duration of the transaction ensures serializability. This is fine on a local node. That's, that's how this is all supposed to work. The problem is that the Galera doesn't look at the shared read locks. It ignores them. 
So when you acquire those locks that are supposed to enforce the, the, uh, the stability of your transactional needs, uh, Galera doesn't use those locks, doesn't propagate them to the other nodes. And so you can get cases where we get mixed transactional reads. So the workaround is to promote all of your shared reads to exclusive locks. So you say uh, select star uh, lock for update or something, select for update. And select for update basically forces it to you know, acquire an exclusive lock, and that lock gets propagated across the system correctly. So basically you turn all of your reads into writes, and the system does what it's supposed to. Um, this is, of course, expensive, but you, you can do it to work around the problem. So uh, TLDR, first committer wins, applies on snapshot isolation. Codership still claims snapshot isolation in their, uh, in their docs, which is wrong, um, but hopefully that'll change. Uh, Procona sort of doubled down on this for a while and then updated their blog post to say, yeah, we know it doesn't actually do snapshot isolation. Um, so I think Glera's user base is sort of slowly coming to terms with this realization and uh, you know, hopefully things will get fixed. We've been about, I think, six, seven months now since I recorded this, and so you know, I think a, a fix should show up sometime soon. Uh, not all is lost. Uh, Glera does not appear to allow dirty reads, um, which is good. Uh, so we definitely have read and committed, and it looks to me like we've got read committed. Not sure about repeatable read. Snapshot isolation is definitely out. Um, my guess is that those uh, the absence of propagating the shared read locks also invalidates repeatable read, but I'm not entirely sure um, because repeatable read phantoms are only a subset of the full phantom problem. I'll have to do another test to figure that out. So if your app works with recommitted, uh, this is probably fine. Um, but as we've seen, recommitted is a actually a surprisingly weak property. It allows you to read two different uh, cells or two different rows, two different you know. Uh, columns in, in your SQL table from logically distinct times. And that, uh, that could be a problem for your application. We're still working on fix. Last but not least, I want to talk about the most recent uh, research I did. This is uh, funded by RethinkDB. They asked me to come and do two analyses uh, looking at the safety of their distributed KV store. So their, uh, their document store looks a lot like MongoDB. Um, you have keys that map to kind of JSON style values. Uh, and they claim this wonderful property of full linearizability for reads, writes, updates on a single key. There's, there's no multi-key transactions like MongoDB. Uh, you can't update two different documents atomically. Um, but, you know, having linearizability on a single document is oftentimes sufficient because the documents can have really complex internal structure. Now, previously, RethinkDB didn't have an automated failover story. So if you lost a node, some fraction of your uh, key space would go unavailable. You just couldn't do updates to it until somebody came in and promoted a new node. Um, and that required sort of operator intervention. But in 2.0, they introduced Raft uh, to do automatic failover. So they now have a consensus system uh, which manages which nodes control which fractions of the key space. They don't actually throw the transactions themselves through Raft. They only use Raft for metadata management. And then once they've established a, a node as an authoritative leader and decided on its offset, that node can do a, a much simpler and faster replication strategy uh, between it and its replicas, which is still guaranteed to be correct by the fact that Raft gave them uh, a sort of lease on a given uh, range of key space. So <laughs> there are, of course, tunable options for reads and writes. Uh, the safe one is majority reads, where you read from a primary, and that primary blocks line up to ensure that it is still a primary by the time the read completes. Majority writes mean that when you write to a primary, the primary has to replicate to a majority of nodes uh, before it can acknowledge your operation. And those two things together are supposed to guarantee the neurosibility. This is a very you know, sort of common uh, way to solve the problem. You see the same thing in Zookeeper uh, with, with uh, sync and, uh, and normal writes. If you do single reads, that's where you can talk to any primary. Uh, and single reads are going to allow you to get uh, dirty and stale reads, uh, like we saw in MongoDB. Um, the reason is that you could talk to a primary and read a value, but that primary might have been superseded in an election by some other newer primary that has newer data, so we could see data from the past. Uh, we could also have outdated uh, reads, and that's where you're allowed to talk to any node whatsoever. This is just an availability optimization. Uh, it allows you to always perform a read, 
but the cost of more often encountering these anomalies. If you do a single write, this is a lot like Mongo's, um, you know, write concern for I think like journal safe and what used to be safe. Uh, this is where you only ask a single replica to acknowledge your write. Because that replica could be superseded by some new or primary, which writes other data on top of it, uh, that could lead to lost updates. So, during your prediction, uh, RethinkDB has a brief latency spike, um, you know, maybe five, ten seconds. Uh, there's a little bit of downtime when it does an election and decides who's going to be the new leaders. And it tends to recover in my tests in about ten seconds. Uh, you can tune these things up and down, but ten is about as short as I managed to get. Um, this is a really nice property. You know, you don't want to be down for multiple minutes. Most people will tolerate a 10 second outage. Um, outdated reads are always available. This is great. Oftentimes, you want to be able to continue to read even in the case of a network partition. And you don't care about getting the most recent values to some data. Every other kind of operation, including those uh, possibly stale or dirty single reads, those still require a majority connected component because those operations have to take place on some primary, and in order to have a primary, you have to have majority somewhere in the cluster. So majority and majority uh, actually passed the linearizability tests. Uh, all the other mechanisms didn't. This is good news, right? We like to see things pass, um, but it's also disappointing for someone like me who wants to see the world burn. And so RethinkDB asked me to come in and do another analysis. We have to go deeper. Uh, I only tested with network partitions and different classes of crash and process pause. Uh, but what if we started messing not just with the consensus system uh, and the replication mechanism, but also with the nodes themselves? What if we added and removed nodes, forced this cluster to rebalance data across itself? So uh, Raft actually has this wonderful way to uh, modify the cluster membership and still proceed with operations. It can do the sort of joint consensus mode. Uh, and it turns out that if you start doing that, it still passes. And this is, of course, very vexing to me. And so we're going to force it to reconfigure the cluster while network partitions are going on. And we're going to interleave those things over 30 minutes or something. And eventually, this fault shows up. It's a, it's a narrow fault. That's a read-only anomaly, but it's still enough to make me think there's something deeper there. And if you push on a little more, after a few weeks, you can reliably repeat this particular weird failure case. This is a write of zero, and the only other process that runs concurrent with that is a compare and set from three to zero. That means that the value has to be three, and then if it's three, it'll be set to zero. Now, this operation completing implies the value is three, but the only possible value of this time must have come from this write of zero. Since zero is not three, this is illegal. We've, we've either lost the update here, or this update is uh, invalid. So this is catastrophic. Right? You're never supposed to see this with majority majority. This is a non-linearizability condition. And you also start seeing these really weird messages in the logs. Things like, guarantee failed. Index should be less than or equal to get latest index. The log doesn't go forward this far. If you go look at the, the code that comes from, uh, this is a case where the RAP leader asks a follower node to apply a range of operations to its local state machine. Now, the leader only asks the follower to do this when the follower has that information committed in its log. So it should never receive this request unless it has a full set of those operations. But this error message shows up when the actual log only has a few of those operations. It doesn't go any further. There's no operations for it to apply. This is some illegal state. The leader has, has the impression that we know what we can do. That's not supposed to happen in RAF. This is a safety check kicking in. The other failure message we get is guarantee fail. Current term leader ID should be equal to request leader ID. And this happens when you get a new message uh, from a leader, and previously you had another message from a leader, a different leader, who claimed to lead the same term. So it's like you're in a room and somebody comes up to you and says, ah, yes, I am the president uh, you know, of, of the US uh, for 2014, and, uh, and somebody else shows up and says, oh, actually, I'm also the president uh, for 2014. You should listen to me instead. Please take this data. And the poor follower you know, screams and says, <laughs> which one of you is real? Uh, my world is ending. This is definitely not supposed to happen in RAF. RAF guarantees you will only have a single leader for any logical term, except that it doesn't here. Why is that? 
So we spent a long time looking at the, uh, the RAF implementation, and it appears to be correct. But there is an issue discovered by the Rethink team uh, where the message is used to start up and shut down the replicas in the system in, in the RAF cluster. Those messages could arrive out of order. So let's say you wanted to start up a RAF replica inside of Rethink TV. You're going to add a new copy of some data. So you send a start message with a sequence number chosen by the RAF cluster itself, so it's monotonic. And you say, OK, start up uh, an instance, and by the way, your name is Foo. So Foo starts up and starts accepting requests and joins the cluster. The cluster does its leadership transition, adopts new membership, everything is fine. And then later, we want to remove Foo, so we say stop. We include a higher sequence number, and we tell the node that it's no longer going to be valid. So it leaves the cluster uh, and deletes its data. So far, so good. Now imagine that a duplicate message occurs, and we end up with a start, a stop, and then the start message is delivered again. Now, this would ordinarily be prevented from taking effect because the sequence number would be lower than the stop message. So we would just ignore this lower operation. We know it's not supposed to take effect. However, <laughs> as Newt says, they, they mostly come at night, mostly. Uh, number 4668, this is a bug in Rethink DB. Back in version 2.1, sequence numbers could be set to max int. And when that happens, there's nowhere else to go. You can't go higher than max int. So uh, as a workaround to allow the cluster to still make progress when it hit this edge case, they had to allow start transitions or active transitions to occur even when the clock had already been maxed out. So the workaround is to always process active messages regardless of what the clock says and what the sequence number says. Well, that's all well and good unless you get one of those duplicates. So we get a start message, and we start off an empty log. We start processing operations, and we build up some log state, and the, the cluster is like, hey, you know, this is great. We, we love you, Fu. You've been really good to us. And Fu says, hey, that's really cool. We're all friends. And then Fu gets a telegram and says, oh, you're not supposed to be part of the cluster anymore. Please leave the party. So Fu walks out of the room and you know, forgets everything that happened. Uh, deletes this log, there's no more state. And then that start message shows up again. And because we ignore the sequence number for the start message, Foo walks right back into the party and says, hey, what did I miss? It's got an empty log. It's as if Foo had never left but suffered amnesia in the middle of the party. And so people are saying, hey, will you vote for me in the election? And Foo says, let me check. Oh, yeah, I haven't voted for anybody yet. I might as well vote for you. So now Fu can issue votes to two different candidates. Two different leaders can arise for the same term. And if we're asked to apply some of these messages that we thought were in Fu's log, Fu doesn't have them anymore. And that's where that uh, log doesn't go this high message comes from. So we've invalidated the raft assumptions by allowing the log to lose data. And this occurred because of a workaround for another bug <laughs> in ordering. Now the patches of this are now available in 224 and 216. Uh, and so Rethink users shouldn't have this problem anymore. I've not been able to replicate any linear instability bugs since. This doesn't mean it's completely safe, but as far as I've hammered on it for the last five months or whatever, uh, it seems to be doing a good job. So, good work, everyone. Uh, to recap, uh, when you choose a database, even if you're not paying money for it, you're signing a contract. You're locking yourself into years of working with a database, uh, becoming familiar with particular failure modes, having to work with this data model, using its client libraries. These are hard decisions to back out of. Right? You're effectively locking yourself into a contract with a database vendor. And database vendors are multi-armed monsters in first level C which. And if you don't uh, you know, satisfy all of the fine print by the third day and you don't kiss the prints, then your data disappears. And you don't get to do any reads again. I don't remember how this story goes. But the point is you need to read that contract very carefully. Read the documentation to figure out exactly what your system is claiming to do. And then, because oftentimes the contract is not quite accurate, you need to go and test the system for yourself. Um, look out for words like strict consistency, strong, acid. These are Weasel words. Uh, I love Weasels in general. It's fine to talk about a system this way, but back it up with a specific definition. Right? So look for, we offer strong consistency. Our model is linearizable, reads and writes. Or we offer serializability, but you, know, you could have the possibility of stable reads. 
Now, if we have these invariants given to us by vendors, we can match them to the rules we actually need. Uh, maybe I've got a, a large store for user comments which doesn't have strong ordering constraints, and so I don't need linearizability. I just need uh, maybe sequential consistency. Finally, it's possible that uh, any guarantees can eventually break. You know, maybe you lose every replica in your system. Uh, figure out how much loss you can tolerate. You know, is it, is it reasonable some of the time to break these guarantees, and how do you plan to cope? Consider your failure modes, too. Uh, you can test your systems under failure modes really easily. Go in and kill a process with kill-9. Uh, go and cause node failures by terminating AWS instances or flipping power switches. You can simulate clock skew just by running the date command on a computer. Or with libfake time, you can tell it turn the clock faster or slower than normal. You can simulate garbage collection I.O. pauses with uh, SIG stop and SIG continue. Uh, you can simulate network partitions, my favorite tool, with uh, IP tables dash J drop. It's real easy. Uh, if you want to get a little fancier, TC will allow you to slow down the network by probabilistically displaying or dropping packets. Ultimately, you have to test your systems end to end. Uh, like Peter Alvaro notes, uh, it's actually really tricky to figure out how two different systems with known guarantees like serializability compose. We don't necessarily know that if you glue together two SQL systems with uh, serializable isolation, that the result will be serializable. So instead of talking about single databases, I want you to think about the invariants across your entire service. The load balancer, the user service, the caching system, and the little Redis cluster you stood up for some temporary analysis, and the two database replicas, all that together should be some properties. So I'm advocating for property-based testing, which is where you generate randomized inputs and then verify the system holds to some high-level invariance, like I should only be able to register a username once. Uh, and then when you're testing, test with distributed systems failure modes. I think you might find surprising results. This work would not have been possible without the help of Vesha Cole, Sidoel Chandrasekharan, Brendan Taylor, Cosmo Nicolescu, Brendan Matthews, Timothy Chen, Aaron Bell, Kyle Conroy, Daniel Muse, Michael Lucy, and Slava Akhmahet over at uh, RethinkDB, everyone at Codership, uh, Mesos, Mesosphere, uh, Stripe and Rethink TV funded the analyses for this work. And uh, thank you all very much. You can read more about this on Jepson.io. So, with all that in mind, we'll go back here. And I'm happy to take any questions. Looks like folks may have gone to sleep. So, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call this a day. Thank you all very much for coming. How, how does. How does anything actually ever work in these systems? That is How my question. How does anything ever work? Uh, luck, I think, and a lot of duct tape. Yeah. Um, it, you know, this is sort of an open problem. Like, we've got good data from Microsoft, HP, a lot of academic networks. They instrument their network failures. And we know that network loss happens really often. Uh, you know, like Google sites that they have, you know, five to eight, like, rack failures per year where a rack just goes offline. It's not clear how often those kinds of failures translate into user visible impact. Um, Amazon and, and Yahoo both ended up redesigning existing systems to be more partition tolerant, and that suggests to me that it was an issue that actually affected their users. But a lot of times for smaller shops, I think these kinds of anomalies just go undetected. And you go and you look at your database and you find out, oh yeah, these keys are missing. How did that happen? Yeah, I think that that's kind of the point that I was getting at that last one. So, I mean, are you finding even sort of mid-level companies, something like Stripe, Square, et cetera, are they doing, are they using Chaos Monkey or anything else where they can kind of uh, do the end-to-end -end systems testing? Mm -hmm. Or is that really, okay, but it's like how much, <laughs> how many resources do, do they have to allocate for that kind of thing? Because I, I can't imagine smaller companies ever doing this or having the time, money. Yeah, it's a real investment. And even just asking the question takes time, right? So uh, there's going to be some return on your investment of engineering time uh, that has to be balanced against the possible cost of losing data. Uh, I think for something like, like the Redis bugs, those tend to be catastrophic. Um, yeah. You know, like uh, Twilio, for example, used Redis as part of their billing system, and network error caused them to overcharge a whole bunch of people. That kind of thing, not so great. But if the impact is only like, well, we couldn't serve web pages for 10 minutes and people came back later, eh, maybe not worth it. Um, somewhere like Stripe, you know, where financial concerns are more important because they're shifting money, 
uh, they actually were willing to invest significant resources, both in time personnel into uh, testing systems. So I worked with Michael Handler over there on verifying uh, the properties of our Q system and how it shuttled data around. We found a couple of interesting data loss cases. Um, but you know, I, th I think as you grow, you tend to invest more infrastructure and tooling time. So people like Google, Yahoo, Amazon, they've got a lot more of this stuff than startups do. Right. OK. Uh, one, one other question. I know it's Saturday. I have yeah. to help build a fence. I'm sure you have fun <laughs> things to do. So. Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, OK. <laughs> Not as fun as, maybe more fun than building a fence. Um, so I have been like in different random areas of distributed systems. And I, you know, obviously I've read through the materials that you recently put up and, you know, I tweeted you that to do the class kind of thing online. General question for me is like, what's, do you have good ideas of where people should start when they feel like novices who want to get into building these systems? So like, ideally I want to either help build these systems or just know enough where I can, you know, architect these things uh, sufficiently where <laughs> things aren't going to burn down in the Twilio use case, right? So what, like, what's your best guidance there? Start with what you've written and then try to find some other articles and read or what? Yeah, I think um, as far as written resources go, one of the best books out there right now that's, that's available for free would be uh, Mixu, M-I-X-U, has a yeah. great introduction um, that has really wonderful advice for practitioners and people who want to build systems. Um, I do a distributed systems class, which I think is a useful theoretical overview, but it's not as um, not as much of a workshop where you would build something functional. Uh, you know, in order to learn, you have to actually sit down and try that darn thing. Um, and so I think once you've once you've read that and maybe a few of the key papers, uh, you know, I, I would look at Leslie Lamport's uh, paper archive, especially um, the stuff on clocks. The part-time parliament access paper is actually really hard. For consensus, I would recommend Diego Angaro's RAF paper. Uh, you know, building a RAF implementation is actually not super hard to do. Um, it, it's it's certainly easier for me than, than Paxos. Uh, and so it can be really fun, I think, to take a couple weekends and try to go and build one of the systems just as a, as a hobbyist project. Um, but you know, if you want to get really good, I think you need I think you need professional hours to put into it, right? So going and applying to a company that builds a distributed database might be your best bet. Gotcha. Okay. How do, how do you build the expertise for that? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, the, <laughs> no. that's a little chicken egg problem. <laughs> yeah. But I think if you have a, if you have a general background in, in programming um, and you've, you've shown that you, you know, can express a solution in code, then a lot of times a distributed system company is willing to hire you and give you some time for training. Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately mentorship is not something we do really well as an industry, but uh, some companies definitely put in the time i would say yeah on average we do do it awfully actually <laughs> rather than mentor you know people bad teams it's the opposite of mentorship no that's helpful yeah it's, i think it's a chicken egg problem right now where i'm trying to build stuff so like i'm building the swim you know hashi cores member list thing in haskell mm -hmm. just for fun for learning but it's kind of easy because i'm basically sort of transliterating from the, the go code base in haskell i mean it's not one-to-one -one, but uh, it's not the same as kind of trying to dig into something like a new space, but I'm also, you know, this is a novice working here, but working, I'm trying to interview with other companies that would be sort of in the distributed system space. And I don't always have answer to their interview questions. And it's interesting because it's like, I've been ruled out at a few places. Like, okay, I can learn. You know, how to, <laughs> I can right. try to tell them I can learn, but it sounds like, yeah, maybe try to find the place that has, that's acceptable for a mentorship that I can work on those kind of systems. So, all right, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, trying to think what else are, are really good resources. Uh, Chris Mickeljohn um, has a, a really good reading list on his blog somewhere uh, that has a whole bunch of sort of really uh, key papers. Um, so yeah, definitely look for that. Uh, as for what companies do mentorship well, I honestly don't know because I haven't worked at a database company before. Um, I, knowing what I do about current SF hiring practice, I, I would imagine that if you can write uh, a toy system and put up the, the code on GitHub, um, you know, say, hey, I wrote a Dynamo implementation, or I wrote a distributed queue, or a raft implementation, you know, any, anything like that, uh, gossip system, um, 
if you just pick a paper, you know, and show that you can implement an academic paper, that's a, that's a strong signal, I think, that you could take a technique that would be relevant to the database company and implement it in code. Um, gotcha. The other thing people tend to look for, at least when, when I was talking to database companies about working there, was um, you know, language coherence. Like, <laughs> we use Scala for this. Do you know any Scala? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> um, you know, so, so you know, maybe the, the best thing to do is to find a Haskell shop and say, like, hey, do you have a need for this kind of distributed systems expertise and sort of pose the problem the opposite way? Gotcha. Yeah, actually, no, I think that that advice will be helpful. Um, Haskell is just a choice just for fun. I actually think Go is not the greatest, <laughs> but it's a, it's a pretty good fit for some of these problems. Um, so, okay. No, that's helpful. Thank you. So appreciate yeah, you're it. welcome. Well, uh, good luck with your friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck with today. Oh, actually, I had there was one other question. Yeah, sure. Probably a simple one. Where to go? Um, you know, I think it escapes me. Maybe I'll question. I'll ping you another time. Uh, no, actually, the question that I had is, is is related to the last one. So, how do you find what's sort of like the appropriate balance between sort of implementation slash practice versus just reading? Oh gosh, for for learning? Yes. I probably have a bad balance because my approach to stuff like that is to, um, I'll do like a cursory literature search and then I'll, you know, I'll read like two, I'll skim, I'll skim some papers and be like, well, does this apply, does this apply? And if I find something that applies to my problem, that's great, I'll read it. But a lot of times the thing I want to solve is this like particular edge case. Like right now I'm trying to figure out how to write a generalized serializability checker. Uh, and a lot of the research is like, well, here's how you verify transactions are serializable if you know their internal structure and you're the database coordinator. They don't help you if you know what the visible end state of the transactions and not how they were ordered. Uh, and so <laughs> trying to solve that problem is a little bit trickier, uh, and I wind up oftentimes just sitting down and staring at it and writing some code. Um, but you know that can pay off too. Like I was really surprised. The, the linearizability checker I wrote was basically I read some papers, and the checker strategies they decided they described were all based on reading and analyzing the code structure. And I didn't have the code because it's a black box test for me. So I wrote my own tester. And then that blog post got cited by uh, Gavin Lowe over at Oxford. And he's like, so we've developed this technique which is significantly faster. And you know, it's sort of underplaying because his version is millions of times faster than mine. Uh, and I was able to go and implement his algorithm and then add additional optimizations on top of that. So if you're, if you're lucky, people in academia will cite you. <laughs> awesome. I think that's the, the optimal outcome because then they're then they're deciding on problem or they're working on the same problem that you are and not some you know tangential thing, right? Um, but for stuff like gossip consensus, those are well understood problems and the existing literature is a lot more valuable. Uh, and okay. then it's sort of a question of like which one of these is most amenable to implementation. All right. So so maybe yeah something like RAF would be the next one if I want to keep learning balancing the implementation versus reading as many papers as I can, materials as well. Yeah. Hey, um, like, it's easy to skim a paper, too. You can you can skim something yeah. in a couple hours. But for me, like, reading a paper is a multi-week effort. I'm, I'm just not very good at it. Um, right. So, you know, it, it, like, pick one to specialize in. And I think if you're going to implement it, that's the way to really understand it. But it's okay to just skim a whole bunch of abstracts and do that just to get a sense of the landscape before you dive into one. Um, and, so, and try to pick a problem that you think is cool enough you'll actually work on it, right? So maybe that's maybe that's gossip systems, and you wind up implementing the plum tree uh, algorithm, um, or maybe you want to build a Dynamo clone. So you start with the the Amazon Dynamo paper, and that's your sort of bible. But maybe there's additional papers like uh, distributed version vectors that you can use to back up that, or interval tree clocks for logical clock systems. Um, yeah, not sure what the right balance is. I, I think I tend to do a lot more writing than coding, or writing than reading, uh, but the reading is still critical, and if people have already solved your problem, you spend more time on it. All right, well, thanks uh, everyone for joining, and I uh, hope you have a good Saturday afternoon.